Hi, I'm Old Norse Specialist Dr. Jackson Crawford. Today on my channel about Norse language and myth, I want to talk about one of the most famous sagas of Icelanders, the Laxdula Saga. Now the title of this saga I'm giving it to you is uh, Old Norse spelling and pronunciation. In modern Icelandic, this is Laxdæla saga, uh, with a uh, predictable change of u uh, to a to i in modern Icelandic. Now this saga begins, as many other sagas do, with a leader in Norway, a hersir, in this case named Ketil Flatnose, who decides that he does not want to stay in Norway and be a uh, uh, an under king, under ruler, who doesn't want to owe anything to anyone higher than he is. And this is the time when Harold Fairhair is uh, conquering all of Norway and subjecting it to his rule as its one king. So Ketel Flatnose decides to move with his family to Scotland. However, Scotland is already inhabited, and uh, the Scots put up stout resistance against the Norse, and Ketel Flatnose is, at one point, uh, killed in some of this action. At this point, his daughter Unner, the deep-minded, Dup Ulga, leads the rest of her family to uh, the Faroe Islands first, and then eventually to Iceland, where they settle in the northwest uh, along the Laxå, the Salmon River. And so the valley of the Salmon River is the Laxdalr, and the people of the Laxdalr are the Laxdalr, so this is the saga of the people of the Salmon River Valley. In Iceland, uh, owner of the deep-minded gives, uh, gives uh, land to not only her freed slaves, but also her free employees, I guess you would call them, her huskarlar. Uh, one of these, by the way, for saga fans, is Ilugi the Black, that is the father of uh, Gunnlaugr Wormtongue. I've covered his saga in a different video in a one-off video. And uh, she arranges good marriages for all of her sons, daughters, grandsons, and granddaughters. And uh, on one such occasion when she has arranged a grand wedding feast uh, for, I think it's a grandson of hers, The uh, it might be a son. Uh, anyway, it doesn't, doesn't really matter. It's a great grand wedding feast. She's, uh, she's going around, she's glad handing everybody, you know, Oh, you came all the way from Borgafjö there. Ha ho, good to see you, all that stuff. And she goes to bed a little bit early, gets into her bed closet. All right, this sort of bunk with a door. She goes in, and then it's late at night when, uh, or late in the morning, when they decide to see what's happening with her because she hasn't gotten out of bed. And it turns out that she has died in her bed. And at this point, the grandson is getting married, just is grateful to her for her consideration because she not only provided a great wedding feast for him, but in the same feast provided a great funeral feast for her. Uh, so that's just how thoughtful she was. And then she is buried in a mound inside of a ship, which of course is um, not much talked about in the sagas, but was evidently a, a grand way to bury uh, people of means in the Viking Age, as we see, for example, in the uh, Usberg ship burial in Norway. Now, one of her uh, granddaughters, one of her granddaughters, is uh, Thorgerther. Thorgerther marries a man named Kollar, and they have a son named Hoskuldr, who will become one of the major protagonists of this saga, as well as in Njall's saga, which I've also made a whole other series of videos about. Uh, Kollar dies, and Thorgerther goes uh, to Norway to live with some wealthy family there. And in Norway, she marries another man, a Heriolver. She and Heriolver have a son, Hrutr, Heriolver dies also. So with both of her husbands dead, she goes back to Iceland to live with her son, Hoskuldr. And then when she dies, uh, she leaves him uh, quite, a, uh, qu quite a generous inheritance. And her son, Rutter, stays behind in Norway with their family there. All right. Now, Hoskuldr is going to marry. Uh, his wife is Jorun and they have several children, the most important of which for this saga is his son Thorleikr. There's also a son Borther, 
And he also has a daughter, uh, Hoskulder Longlegs, Longbrook, who is another major character in Yal Saga. Actually, one of the four or five main characters in that huge saga. Uh, but Hoskulder, wealthy man, well married, he's got kids. He decides that his farm buildings aren't worthy of his status in life. And so he goes to Norway to see if he can't buy some good timber to build some finer buildings. While he's in Norway trading, he uh, is at a, uh, a merchant cabin, looking at merchant tents, and there's a particular tent set off apart from the others, and he goes in, and inside is a man dressed a little bit different. And uh, Hoskulder seems to comment on his odd dress, and the man introduces himself, says, yes, I'm called Gilly the Russian. So apparently the way he's dressed must be somehow Russian to a medieval uh, Norse imagination. And uh, Hoskulder's looking at his wares, and he's got some pretty nice stuff, and he says, I wonder if you've got something that I really want. And the man says, well, what's that? And Hoskulder says, I, I want to buy an Ambot, a uh, slave woman. And so then we have an interesting exchange. <laughs> Icicles falling all over me, that's why I keep looking around. Um, I have an interesting exchange uh, in, in this purchase, and I'm going to give you my English translation of the scene. So Gilly pulls back a uh, curtain behind which there's 12 slave women Holskuller can choose from, and Holskuller particularly likes one of them. And so he says to Gilly, this is beginning of my translation from the saga, Then Holskuller said, How much will this woman cost if I want to buy her? Gilly said, For her, you'll have to pay three merker of silver. Now, a mork is a uh, measurement in weight of silver, right? They don't have currency. It's not 50 cents a dollar of silver. It's some weight, so three weight units of silver. It seems to me, said Holskulder, that you price this slave woman excessively high because this is three times the normal asking price. Then Gilly answered, you speak truly, and I do value her higher than the others. So choose one of these others and you can pay me just a mork of silver, and I'll keep this particular one for my own. Holskulder said, first I need to see how much money is in this money bag that I have in my belt here. Then he asked Gilly to bring the scales while he dug through his money bag. Then Gilly said, I want this purchase to be done without any falsehoods on my part, so let me say that there is a great defect in this woman. And he uses the same word you would say for like a defect in, a, in, in merchandise. And I want you to know that, Hoskulder, before we conclude this deal. Hoskulder asked what this defect might be. Gilly answered, this woman is unable to speak. I have tried to talk with her in many ways and have never gotten a word out of her. It is definitely my opinion that she can't speak at all. Then Holskulder answered, bring the scales out and let's see what my money bag here weighs. Gilly did so. The silver was weighed out and it was three merker. Then Holskulder said, so this will be our deal. You take this money and I'll take this woman. I say that you have behaved drangalega in this matter because you showed no wish to lie to me. So of course the sagas are a product of a different time. A man is dranger of praiseworthy masculine behavior if he... Uh, is honest about the defects in the merchandise he's selling, regardless of whether that merchandise is, uh, is a human woman. Uh, now, when we come back after a word from my sponsor, uh, we'll look a little bit more at uh, what happens with Hoskulder and his slave woman, who may be more than she seems to be at first. <laughs> Now, it's true that the slave woman does not speak at all, so Holskuller thinks she can't. He buys her some finer clothing than Gilly had put her in, and everyone seems to comment that she's particularly good-looking in these good clothes, which hints that maybe she's not a slave. Remember, the Norse are extremely classist about looks, so if you are good-looking, you cannot be poor, <laughs> right? And vice versa, pretty much. Uh, we see that all the time. That's, that's uh, part of uh, the Saga of the Volsungs. It's in the Saga of Ragnar Lothbrok. Uh, with Oslaug and Ragnar. It's a huge trope for them. He brings her back to Iceland, and his wife Jorun is not very happy about Holskulder coming back with a slave woman, but the saga tells us that he is a good husband and he just sleeps with his wife once he's back in Iceland. Nonetheless, uh, she does give birth to a son, uh, the slave woman does, and uh, we're told in typical saga fashion, presaging what an important grand character this will be, how handsome this child is. I've never understood that. I mean, are babies 
good looking or bad looking, but sagas make a big deal sometimes about how good looking babies are. <laughs> it doesn't make sense to me. Um, and so this child grew up, uh, a homeschooler named him Olaver. And uh, Olaver, and another thing is kind of typical of saga protagonists, is that he's said to be, uh, to look and talk like he's much older than he really is. So by the time he's two, he looks and talks like he's four. So years pass, and uh, Olavar is two years old, and Hoskolder happens to be outside one day when he hears him talking to a woman whose voice he doesn't recognize. He goes to where they're at, and he finds that it's Olavar talking to his mother, the slave woman. So he says, aha, you can't talk. And she confesses that yes, she can, and that her true name is Melkorka, and that she is not a slave by birth, but in fact she is the daughter of Mirkertan, king of the Irish. <laughs> now this is, side note, a little bit related to something in, in the Icelandic origin story is, for the most part, slaves are Irish, Irish or Scottish in, in the North Atlantic Norse world. And so the Icelanders are aware that many of their own ancestors are Irish or Scottish slaves, but they tend to sort of aggrandize it by turning them into, you know, oh, these are enslaved noblemen, noble women, uh, princesses and princess. And so this is something, it's probably a product of that cultural imperative, this awareness of origins in the, the enslaved population, but the desire to kind of aggrandize your own family's origins in that uh, enslaved population, if that makes sense. Um, it's a little bit like how in the U.S. South, uh, at least for a long time, uh, you know, Cherokees might be looked upon uh, negatively by the wider culture, but people might still claim Cherokee ancestry, but they would typically turn it into, you know, the quote unquote Cherokee princess that it seems like every third family in the South has somewhere in their background. Uh, so that the population itself isn't looked upon highly, but people being aware they have origins in it kind of aggrandize the particular people they think they're descended from in that subordinate or, or disliked or segregated population. Well, Oliver uh, is uh, going to be fostered by a man named Thorther, which the saga gives a huge long digression about in chapters 14 to 16 that really doesn't matter. Um, but for poor Melkorka, uh, this makes things worse because now Jorun is more jealous of her. Not only is she this beautiful slave that uh, Holskiller is clearly slept with, at least before he got to Iceland, uh, but now she finds that she is a princess, or at least claims to be. So one day when Jorun is, as part of her slave duties, taking Jorun's, uh, Melkorka is taking Jorun's socks off, Jorun grabs the socks and starts beating Melkorka in the face with them, at which Melkorka punches her back in the face and breaks her nose. So Holskiller has to separate them, and then he uh, frees Melkorka and gives her her own farm so she doesn't have to put up with this sort of thing anymore. But Melkorka is never happy that people call Olaver Peak. <laughs> he's uh, Olaver after he's he's taken in by Thorther. Um, he's, he becomes known as Olaver Peacock, and so he's he's always known as that Olaver Poi, Olaver Peacock, because he wears uh, very flashy clothes. Uh, once Olaver grows up, so we fast forward about 20 years, Melkork is just never satisfied at the way that people think that he is a slave woman's son. She, she's not satisfied with the fact that people don't really acknowledge his, his awesome origins as grandson of a king. And so she's got a suitor who's been bothering her for a while. He's a wealthy enough man that she agrees to marry him on the condition that he will buy a ship for Oliver Peacock. He does, so Oliver Peacock takes off, uh, heading to Ireland to uh, meet his royal ancestor. He takes with him a distinct uh, ring that Melkorka's father had given her and a distinct belt and knife that she says that her foster mother in Ireland will recognize. Now this may sound strange to us, a, a belt or a knife someone might recognize, but that's because we live in a world of mass production. In a world where your belt, your knife, was probably made on your farm or by somebody you personally know, it was probably pretty recognizable, right? It's not the same today where you carry a Victorinox and it's the same Swiss Army knife as anybody else. Now, I have a knife that maybe not that many other people have, but uh, it's not handmade. 
and it's still a recognizable model, these people would probably be able to recognize specific knives or specific individuals they knew well. So uh, Oliver Peacock takes off. He does not go straight to Ireland though. He goes to Norway first where he meets uh, King uh, Haralder Greycloak as well as his mother, Queen Gunhildr. Uh, there's a side note uh, about her that I'll come back to in a moment. Uh, the king is impressed with him and gives him 60 stout Norwegian men to take with him to Ireland, presumably for security. Uh, Oliver Peacock then proceeds to Ireland where his ship wrecks, but uh, when he's attacked by the Irish on the shore, uh, King Mirkartan shows up, you know, plot convenience playhouse. Here's the king just showing up. Random ship wrecks offshore somewhere in Ireland. Um, and the king recognizes how much this boy looks like him, this young man looks like him, and then uh, is impressed by how well the boy speaks Irish because Melkorka has taught Oliver Peacock the Irish language. Of course, it means Old Irish, right? The old Celtic language of Ireland. I'm not talking about Hiberno English. Uh, and he then recognizes, once he, he's in Oliver Peacock's presence, he does recognize the ring, and the uh, old foster mother recognizes the belt and the knife, too. Now, Oliver Peacock remains in Ireland, I think, for two years. He works with uh, Mir Kjartan, repelling Viking invaders, so repelling uh, <laughs> people like him that just don't happen to be the grandsons of Irish kings. Um, and Mir Kjartan even says that he's willing to give Oliver Peacock his kingdom, even above his legitimate sons. But uh, Oliver Peacock decides eventually he's just too homesick, he's going to go back to Iceland. But before he does that, he sails back to Norway first, spends a year there in the service of King Harald the Grey Cloak. The king also doesn't want him to go, you know, this is such a saga trope. The saga hero is so awesome that everybody wants him everywhere. But when he finally decides to leave, uh, the king shows his favor to him by giving him a, a red set of clothes. So he's dressed all in red, which is an expensive dye. So this shows status back then, but it's funny to think that he's basically dressed as an elf on the shelf. Um, and he sails back to Iceland. Here's the side note. Uh, remember that Harry Ulver was the second husband of Thorgerder, the mother of Hulskuller. Okay. And they had a son named Hruter who stayed in Norway. Now Hruter has come back to Norway in the midst of all this, um, come back to Iceland in the midst of all this from Norway. And he is also a man who has served uh, under King Harald of Greycloak. He has also served under, if you know what I'm talking about, uh, the Queen Mother Gunnhildr, uh, certainly Njal Saga, uh, which also involves these same characters, makes it sound like there was there was a, something going on between them. And initially when he shows up, uh, his brother Holskulder actually rebuffs him because he says, Hruter, uh, when our mother married your father, Harry Ulver, I was her oldest living male relative, so I had the right to refuse any suitor. I would have refused him. That makes you an illegitimate son, so you don't get uh, any part of the inheritance from our mother. This displeases Hruter, who thinks he's owed half of that inheritance. So Hruter ends up starting to, uh, he, he makes his own farm and starts stealing from Holstler's farm. He's going to steal half of it for his own. And so on one occasion, he steals uh, 20 of Holstler's 40 beef cattle. And he's pursued by 15 of Holstler's uh, Huskarlar, his free employees. But he kills four, wounds the other 11, and sends them back to Holstler, which, of course, makes Holstler furious. But Hulskulder's wife, Jorun, persuades him that Hruter is too good of a man to be on the wrong side of and that his brothers, they ought to be at peace. So Hulskulder does end up splitting the property with Hruter and uh, they mostly become good neighbors. Hruter will later feud with Thorlaker, Hulskulder's son, but that's immaterial to Luxtola saga. Um, anyway, Hruter is back uh, in Iceland at this point, as is uh, Oliver Peacock. So let's get back to Oliver Peacock, who's the main hero of the story. This is what makes Laxadola Saga hard, is there's so many digressions about so many characters. It is shorter than Njal's Saga, but it is so much more wandering. Now picture this. Oliver Peacock, back from Norway. 
He's been in the service of two kings. He's the confirmed grandson of a king. He's wearing pure red set of clothes. He's got a golden helmet on. I forget who gave him that. And he has some grand sword given to him by his grandfather, Irish king, Nier Cairtan. He is Chartres' man. And he's fabulously wealthy. With everything he's brought back from Norway and Ireland. And his dad, Holskuller, says, you know, the one thing you're missing, son, is a wife. Let's get you a good match. And uh, Oliver Peacock says, well, you must have somebody in mind. And uh, Holskuller says, yes, I do. Her name is Thorgerther. And she is the daughter of Egil Skallagrimsson, of course, the hero of Egil Saga, which I covered in, I think, a five-part series of videos on this channel. So at the All Thing, right, the annual festival slash legislative assembly slash Supreme Court of Iceland. Holskulder approaches Egil, who's someone who knows, doesn't live all that far away, different parts of Western Iceland, and proposes the notion that uh, Egil might marry his daughter Thorgerther to Holskulder's son, Oliver Peacock. Egil thinks it would be a good match, but he's too aware of how bad marriages go when the daughters don't get a say. So he offers his daughter Thorgir the, the veto. This is something good fathers uh, are supposed to do in the sagas. They don't have to marry their daughters away with the daughter's permission, but if they don't have the daughter's permission, the, the marriage is gonna go terribly, always in the sagas. We saw that in Nell saga for sure, with uh, Hage the Longlegs, um, one of Hoskulter's daughters. Anyway, Egil gives her the veto, and she does veto it. She says, Dad, I thought you loved me best. I certainly thought you loved me enough not to marry me off to some slave woman's son. And Egil says, well, your information is wrong there. Actually, he is not a slave woman's son. That slave woman is an Irish princess. She's the daughter of Mirkerton, king of the Irish. And she says, yeah, Dad, everybody says that. Come on, I don't believe it. So she refuses. So Thorgather says no to Egil. Egil tells that to Hoskulder, who tells Oliver Peacock, who says... Ulvar etta anars erindi. Wolves eat another one's errand, i.e., if you want something done, do it yourself. So now, Oliver Peacock marches over to Egil's booth, his tent at the All Thing, uh, and he spots a woman who is uh, both beautiful and well dressed, and so he assumes this must be Thorgir, the daughter of Egil. Notice he's never met her before. Right? These negotiations are being carried out on the basis of family status, not on the basis of these two personally falling in love. He, he, he has to guess that this is her. And he walks over and sits next to her. And just imagine the scene, right? He's strolling toward her. I think we're supposed to really hear sharp dressed man here. He's got his full red suit of clothes on. He's got his golden helm. He's got his king's sword. And he sits down next to her and he says, and I gotta give you this in Old Norse. And I gotta do it in my arch nemesis's voice. <clears throat> Oh, where is this? Aha. Mun ther thykja djarfur ambotarsonren er han thorir at sitja hjó þér og atlar at tala við þig. You must think this slave woman son is bold when he dares to sit next to you and tries to talk to you. And she responds, Þatt mun tu hugsa að þú mun þykjast hafa gort meri thorren ráun en tala við konur. You must think that you've had greater tests of your courage than talking with women. Well, now they get to talking, and she ends up liking him, and so she decides to change her mind. Oliver Peacock calls Egil over, come on over here, and they uh, arrange the marriage. So the wedding will be held at the end of the summer. It will be held um, at Hoskulder's Place, which is actually what it's, the name of his farm is in, in Old Norse. It's Hoskuld's Stather, it's Hoskuld's Place. Um, as a gesture of respect to the groom's family, perhaps this gesture of respect being necessary because originally the daughter had kind of dissed uh, Oliver Peacock's origins. And at the wedding, uh, Oliver Peacock will give Egil his sword uh, given to him by his grandfather, Mirkerton the king. So making good inroads with the in-laws. Important when you're in-law, somebody like Egil Skallagrimsson, as anybody who knows his saga knows. Uh, things go pretty well after this for a while. Oliver Peacock inherits the farm of his foster father, Thorther. Uh, but eventually he becomes interested in another patch of land, a large property that's been abandoned uh, because his sheep are constantly going over there grazing and, and the land is good and so he takes a strong interest in it. But the reason this land has been abandoned, even though it's so good, is that it's haunted by a zombie, an Afterganga. 
Uh, this is a man named Viga Rapper uh, who died and has come back as a zombie because he was a, a jerk in life who died sitting up in his house with his eyes open and this all contributes to coming back as a zombie in their estimation. I've done a video on the Afrigang you can find on my channel. The Afriganga or Norse zombie. Um, but Oliver Peacock's not too worried about the zombie. He pays the uh, the heir of Vika Rapper, now zombie, uh, for the land. In fact, it's interesting to note he pays three Merker of silver for it, so he pays the same amount for this land as his dad paid for his mom. And then uh, there's a scene where he starts, he and his, his Huskarlar, his free employees, start driving his cattle from his old farm to his new farm. And supposedly the tail of the last animal is still on his old property while the nose of the first one is on his new property. This is how fabulously wealthy he is that he's got that much of a herd when you stretch it out. And as he passes his dad's place, which is in the middle of the two, his dad whole school is standing out there to wish him good luck. And even Jorun has always been kind of jealous. Uh, where Olafur Peacock and his mom are concerned, says that maybe the slave woman's son is turning out uh, all right for himself. Well, things go pretty well at the new place, although Oliver Peacock's head cowboy, <laughs> it's hard to know what else to call him, the guy who managed the beef cattle, comes to uh, Oliver Peacock one, one night and says, uh, I want a new job. And Oliver says, why? What's wrong? And he says, well, there's this zombie that never lets me into the barn at night. So Oliver Peacock goes to the barn. Sure enough, there's a zombie in the doorway. He spears it, uh, but the zombie then sinks into the earth. Zombies can kind of travel like prairie dogs in these stories uh, with the uh, spearhead attached to him. So Oliver's left with just the spear shaft, just a staff. In the morning, he goes to where Viga Cropper's buried, finds him in his grave because like uh, folkloric vampires, the Afterganga Norse zombie sleeps in its grave during the daytime, and he finds the spearhead, in fact, inside of the zombie. So he burns the zombie and scatters the ashes at sea. Now, it's not long after this that Hoskolder dies. And as he feels death coming near, he calls his two legitimate sons, Thor Laker and Borther, to his side and tells them that he wants Oliver Peacock to inherit equally alongside them. He wants the inheritance split in thirds. Borther is fine with this, but Thorlaker has never liked Oliver Peacock, his illegitimate brother, and resisted. Uh, when Oliver Peacock is called, uh, however, he just takes his third of the inheritance in stuff, like treasures given to Holskolder by kings, and not in the real property, the, the, the farm and land. And that seems to somewhat mollify Thorlaker. So Thorlaker and Borther split the, the real property, the, the actual farm. When Hoskolder actually dies, uh, it is too late in the fall for people to realistically travel. And of course, they want to have a big funeral for their dad, a big funeral feast, as is appropriate for such a wealthy man with friends from all over Iceland. So they want people to be invited from all over and, and come. They don't want it to be just some small affair for the people who are real close. So they put it off for the next fall. They announce it at the All Thing, or Oliver Peacock announces it at the All Thing the next summer. And he says that everyone in Iceland from beggars on up can come. And he pays for most of it right out of his own pocket. More than a thousand people show up. And the saga assures us this is the second best funeral feast ever thrown in Iceland. <laughs> the, the, the most splendid is, is, is uh, a more obscure one, I think, actually. And anyway, at this funeral feast... Uh, Holskolder also decides to offer his brother Thorlaker, half-brother Thorlaker, another olive branch. He says, why don't I foster your son, Boli, alongside my son, Kjartan? They're about the same age. They say that the man who fosters another son is lower ranking than the man whose son he fosters. So this is a way uh, for Holskolder to also kind of give Thorlaker some of the prominence that he wants as the oldest son of Holskolder, even though he's not the wealthiest or most famous son of Hoskolder. That makes Thor Laker pretty happy. So Boli's going to grow up with Kjartan at Oliver Peacock's place. Um, Kjartan is going to be just like his dad, you know, the handsomest kid who's best at everything. But we're told that Boli is second best at everything. So the saga from this point forth focuses on those two. 
Before I'm done with this chunk of the saga focusing on the earlier generation, though, let me tell you two side stories about two other kids of Oliver Peacock uh, and, and his early years. One of the side stories is uh, Oliver Peacock has an infant son named Haldor that he sends to be fostered by an old man named Bersi. And there's a fun little vignette where um, Bersi is at home alone with baby Haldor, and Haldor falls out of his cradle. So Bersi gets up to pick him up, but Bersi falls down on the way. And so he winds up on the floor looking at this baby that's on the floor. And he says this poem is kind of fun. He says, Ligium bodir i lama sesi, Aldor ok ek, Hovum engitrek, Velder elli mer, En uska ther, Thes spatnar ther, En thuigi mer. We both lie in a useless state, Aldor and I without strength. It's old age that does it to me, And youth to you, And for you it will get better, But not for me. Anyway, Bersi does live actually for many years beyond that and is a good foster father to Aldor. Uh, but the other side story from these early years is 20 or so years, we have to imagine, after Oliver Peacock's marriage, he, like his dad Holskolder before him, goes to Norway to buy timber to make some grand buildings for his farm. While he's there, he stays with a man named Germunder, who then um, pays... Oliver Peacock to take him uh, to, to Iceland with him when he goes back to Iceland. Germunder wants to settle out in Iceland now. But while staying with Oliver Peacock over the winter in Iceland, Germunder falls in love with Oliver Peacock's daughter, uh, Thurir. Now, Oliver Peacock does not want this guy for a son-in-law. He doesn't like Germunder. He accepted his money. He accepted his hospitality, but he's, they just don't get along. So he doesn't want him to be a son-in-law. So he refuses when Garamunder asks him if he can marry Thorither. But Garamunder pays Thorgerther, Egil's daughter, uh, to uh, ask her husband, Oliver Peacock, to reconsider, and at his wife's insistence, he agrees to marry Thorither to Garamunder. And as a neat saga fan, skaldic poem fan side note, it is at the wedding of Thorither to Garamunder in the splendid hall that Oliver Peacock builds with the timber he brings back from Norway, that the poet uh, Wilver Uggason composes the poem Hustropa, which is one of the most famous Scaldic poems, uh, and uh, actually one of the, the sort of rare uh, independent Scaldic sources for Norse mythology. All right, anyway, Three years after this, Germander's actually pretty sick of his wife, pretty sick of his daughter, pretty sick of Iceland. He's got a one-year-old daughter named Groa now with his wife Thurither. So he tells Oliver Peacock that he's going to abandon his wife and daughter and go back to Norway. And Oliver says, great. <laughs> I'm sick of having you around. Uh, take my ship and everything on it. Get out of here. So Germander assembles a crew, packs his stuff up, starts sailing away, but he immediately loses... Uh, the wind, the wind just goes dead still when he's still in the fjord, and so he has to lay at anchor for two weeks within sight of the wife and daughter on land that he's trying to abandon. Awkward, right, fellas? Well, one night, Thurither gets on a boat, and she rows out to the ship, and she goes to where her husband is sleeping, and she takes the sword, the glorious sword, Fotbiter, of course it means footbiter, uh, out of his sleeping bag and places their daughter there instead. Then she rows back out, and Garamunder wakes up when he hears the baby crying. And so he shouts out, and he looks overboard, and he sees his wife on the rowboat. And he says, come back here, give me back my sword. And she says, no, you have treated me too odrangaliga, too much, too undrangerly. And so since he's never going to get the sword back, he shouts at her. Oh, by the way, she had brought some workers from Oliver Peacock's farm with her who had drilled holes in the uh, emergency boat on the ship so that he couldn't follow her. So he's never going to get his sword back. So he shouts this out at her. Thot lat ek tho umelt a thetasferd verdi theim manni at bana i udvari at. 
call me view. Then I let it be said about it that this sword will be the death of the man in your family who will be the biggest loss to you and who will least deserve it. Well, Garamander is going to die in a shipwreck on his way back to Norway, presumably along with baby Groa, although that's not explicitly stated. And Thurither is going to come back to shore and give this sword Fótbíthr, which we have heard far from the last from, to her foster brother and cousin, Bolli. All right, well, that's a pretty good place to leave off before getting into the main stories about Kjartan and Bolli. And for now, from beautiful Colorado, let me wish you all the best. Now let me make a quick PSA here. Um, I know many people are, and, and I'm flattered that many people are interested in coming to the University of Colorado to study with me or, or take my classes. But remember, as discussed in several videos, I am leaving the Nordic program at the end of spring 2020. So I will no longer be teaching classes like Norse mythology, Icelandic sagas at CU. If those classes continue to be taught at CU, they'll be taught by somebody else. I will no longer have any association with the Nordic program. I will still be at the University of Colorado in an unpaid position as resident scholar. And hopefully uh, during this period, I'll have more time to uh, make these videos, which of course reach more people than any classroom ever will, um, work on my upcoming translations such as the Prose Edda and work on my class in Norse mythology for the great courses. But please don't come here thinking, um, that, that I run some, some Hogwarts for Old Norse. I, I, I don't, and you're not gonna find that anywhere, actually. There really aren't any good jobs teaching this stuff, and I need to try to make a living. Um, and actually, given the lack of rewards in teaching this stuff in a conventional way in classrooms, I, I need to take the time away from the classroom to work on these projects that really reach the people that are interested in this stuff, the videos, the books, and now great courses. All right. Well, as always, for beautiful Colorado, let me wish you all the best and uh, good health and the best to you and yours during this uh, whole coronavirus situation in April 2020. All the best. <laughs>